This is a film studio. It's in rural northern Virginia, about 50 miles west of Washington, D.C. The movies made here are filled with suspense, murder, cannibalism, devils, abandonment. In other words, classic children's stories. I think that there's something in the human psyche or psychology that responds to these tales. Tom Davenport heads up Davenport Films and has been probing that psyche for about 15 years. I mean, you can tell Hansel and Gretel to a China, Chinese person and probably they recognize it as a story, you know, the essential parts as a story of their own. So it cuts across uh, national and linguistic backgrounds. It's sort of universal in a sense. Once upon a time on the edge of a great forest lived a woodcutter and his family. Times were hard and for days the poor man had not been able to find work or sell what little he gathered from the forest. It started with Hansel and Gretel. In the mid-1970s, Davenport was a documentary filmmaker. Because of his two sons' interest in the story, he and his wife decided to film it on their own, putting up their own money. They used local folks in the cast and locations near home. The film is faithful to the original, but its setting is rural America. I decided to set it like 1930, you know, in the Depression. That's why the people were poor, why they had to take the kids out and leave them in the woods. And there were versions of Hansel and Gretel, but they're all really kind of sugary sweet and, and, and nice. And I kind of told it like I thought it was. That story's pretty dark. If you did that story in modern terms, people wouldn't accept it. The modern version would be, you know, guy gets into debt and, decide, and, is, and marries some floozy and meets in a bar, you know, after, and she says, let's take the insurance policy out and the kids and drop them off in some wilderness in the West. And then they get picked, they, they, they abandon them there, and then they get picked up by some cannibal freak who's living out in the wilderness. I mean, you could go to the ABC, NBC, hey, I got a great idea for a children's song. How do you, I mean, children's movie, how do you like this? Nobody in the world would think that was a children's movie. But in fact, it is the classic story of Hansel and Gretel. Well, this, as I was telling you, this is the, this is the site of Hansel and Gretel's, Gretel's house, which is the first film that we, uh, we made in the series and really got to see it. One of the most troubling facets of the story for many people is the part played by the father. He supposedly loves the children and yet allows the wicked stepmother to abandon them in the woods. You know, this story is about taking them out in the forest and then abandoning them, but what it's really about is the fact that often children feel that they're being abandoned in other kinds of ways, maybe in terms of attention or, uh, you know, feelings for or, 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 or love or whatever. So it has a reality that is beyond the kind of literal reality. Of course, no father would really take his kids out and leave them in the woods like that, but because it's psychologically true, it has a validity that makes the story powerful. In the moonlight, they begin to search for the bits of bread, but found none. The thousands of birds that live in the forest had eaten the crumbs as fast as they had been dropped. They were lost at last. Because they didn't sugarcoat the story, the film was released to some controversy. Ironically, the controversy helped find it an audience, largely at public libraries across the country. So Tom decided to build on the acceptance of Hansel and Gretel. What I really wanted to do was build a kind of cottage industry of filmmaking. Instead of make caning chairs or making oak, split oak baskets, I was going to make movies. And, and uh, since there wasn't much else to do except work on the farm, I'd try to sell them out of my house. And so that's what basically we do. We kind of mail order sell them now. For their next film, they went back to the Brothers Grimm and chose another familiar tale. Rapunzel! Let down your hair! Their third tale to tell was The Frog King. Once again, it was set in America. It's the story of a princess who loses her golden ball down a well. When a frog retrieves it for her, she promises to be his friend forever but reneges. Then, later on, the frog shows up for dinner. Tom particularly wanted to shoot this film because of a house he knew nearby that had a wonderful room. It looked like a, you know, a robber baron's dining room with paneled with walnut. And all along the room with his collection of this animals that this guy had shot and stuffed, these heads, from, uh, from, the, from his uh, early days in the 1920s. And all these animals sitting there, and I said, well, gee, you know, really be funny film if you had a frog 
come to dinner at this dining room with all these lions and rhinoceroses and antelope, these noble animals, and you have a little lowly frog come to dinner. So that's how that kind of was, was stimulated. Once again, they set the story in America and turned the king into a wealthy American industrialist. He helped you when you needed it. Now, you can't go back on your word. But, Father! And you must keep your promise. With the success of these three films, Davenport approached the Corporation for Public Broadcasting to fund more productions. He sent them a copy of The Frog King to help establish his credentials. The film in the CPB offices started circulating among the secretarial staff, and everybody was taking it out in lunch hour and watching it. And I had the feeling that one of the reasons that we got the award from the Corporation, or contract with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, is the fact that all those secretaries kept watching that film and they kept telling other people around, and it became a little kind of ph phenomenon at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. The CPB award resulted in a series of stories which are carried by public television stations in the instructional schedule during the day. One of them is Davenport's adaptation of a particularly American story called A Jack Tale. And the, the original tale was called Jack and the Doctor's Gal, but ours was Jack and the Dentist's Daughter, and he wants to marry this... Uh, Dennis' daughter, and the, the Dennis is black, but he's a very light-colored black man, so there's a kind of class structure. He doesn't want this farm boy to marry his daughter, and Jack's got to prove himself. So we were dealing with elements in black culture that made that film very interesting and appropriate. And I realized when I made that film that I could make all these American films easier. Jack, you get yourself $1,000 and come back here, then I'll think about you and my daughter getting married. But, but until then, I don't want to see your face around here. Inside, yeah. inside. Other grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities funded production of another Jack tale, Soldier Jack, the story of a man who became a hero when he captured death. He produced Ash Pet, an American version of Cinderella. He'd wanted to set it in the World War I era, but found that World War II costumes were much cheaper to obtain. So, World War II it was. Wait! Wait! I don't even know your name! Davenport Films' latest production is called Mutzmag, an Appalachian tale, adapted from an old Scottish story called Molly Wuppity. Tom showed us the set, which opens the film as it looks in the winter. And I had to plan, you know, in the spring, I had to plant this entire, I had raised thousands of cabbage plants and planted them there and covered everything with, uh, and cultivated it. And when you started shooting around August, the cabbages you see in the film are pretty grown. And then, at, then of course, later on... Mutzmag is a young girl who gets into a number of scrapes but escapes through resourcefulness with a pocket knife and a ball of string. The story begins when her sickly mother dies. The exteriors were shot here, but the inside of the cabin is really a soundstage miles from here. Ooh, that looks awful pretty, Nate. Oh, yes. Go put some in a basin. All this is is a facade. I mean, this doesn't even have a roof on it. You, you, we, didn't have, we didn't even have to cover up the roof. It's just a big, empty box, essentially, with a, with a frame around it. But all this is is a facade, and then as soon as you open the door, and as soon as those people go inside, they're inside an actual set, which we built over in a dance hall, Buchanan Hall, over Don't in Upperville. Put it on the floor. There's a scene where Mutzmeg comes in and she looks out the window and she sees her mother fall down, fall down in the cabbage patch because she's sick. Now, in this case, she looked out a window in the set. Of course, all she saw when she looked out that window in the set was a wall. <laughs> I mean, you know, or it was inside. So we came around here, and when we shot her point of view, we actually used the shot through this very window and the mother collapses right out there in the, in the cabbage patch. It's a real short scene. But again, the magic of film always is the ability to, to uh, create a, a, a space of the imagination in the time of the imagination. So you're not limited by, uh, by, your, by the actuality of the thing. I'm hurt so bad. After their mother dies, Mutzmag sets off with her two selfish half-sisters to find their fortune. Their first stop is a mysterious cabin. Come on. Come on the door. 
And they approach the cabin, and when they approach the cabin, they're attacked by this dog, this terrible dog that's on this chain to try to bite them. Since the dog is one of the stars of the film, Tom took us over to meet him. No, not this dog. This dog's a, well, a pussycat. This dog. He belongs to one of Tom's neighbors and never did like strangers. So we all got back in the car, because everybody, oh, we were all frightened of him, and we all locked the doors in the car, and they chained him up, got him all ready, and he was on that chain, and we were just hoping that he wasn't going to break the chain. And I'd go out there, stand next to the cameraman, and we'd walk around, and he'd try to bite me. And that's how we got that scene, and we cut it together with the girls. But actually, when we were actually filming, filming the thing, we didn't have the dog with the girls out there. I'd just get down on my hands and knees, and then the girls would go out, and we'd film the girls, and I'd go, rawr, rawr. So on the set, the dog would jump back like that. But it was basically me barking at him, and then we cut in the other shot, and that's how we did it. The dog in the original story was not mean, but because it calls for Mutt's Mag to trick a giant into killing it, they had to make it a mean dog for modern audiences. We had to make the dog kind of evil in order to justify his death at Mutt's Meg's hands. This wasn't a part of the Appalachian story, and it tells you a lot about how country people thought of animals, not in a sentimental or romantic kind of way, you know. Robbie Sams plays the lead and was cast in Madison County, North Carolina. She has cystic fibrosis, and it was a bit of a gamble to give her such a key role. She had never acted in films before, and because movies are shot out of sequence, the very first scene she had to do comes toward the end of the film, where the giant catches her and stuffs her in a sack. I don't know. I just might have to kill you! And she said the worst thing about it in the first couple of takes, he was stepping on her head and her hands while he was there. And she didn't holler, didn't let it out of peep, because she thought, well, my God, I'll ruin the take if I holler. She didn't know that we could cut the sound out, whatever. And this was her debut, <laughs> and uh, being stuffed into that sack about three times. <laughs> but every time I went to that kid and told her, look, Robbie, this film really depends on you, and you, ha you have to pull yourself together, she would, she would pull herself together. And she was a person because of the fact, I think, knowing that she had this disease, and knowing that her time really was limited. She was much more mature than a girl of that age would normally be, and consequently brought a lot to the part simply because of that, I think, that, uh, that wouldn't have been there. And she is outstanding in that film. I mean, she, the whole film re really revolves around her. Mutzmeg had its premiere at the Smithsonian Institution, an indication of the serious interest in folk tales and fairy tales. Folk tales are kind of, or fairy tales are kind of like public dreams. You know, we have our private dreams and it, they're kind of weird, but folk tales are kind of weird too, but we all share these public dreams. My story's told, there is no more, but there's a mouse behind the door. The first of you that catches her can make a great big cap from her fur.